It's on page 789 of your pew Bibles. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he show forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off the nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I've laid waste to their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept my correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you. And as we read such a text, we realize it is sobering. For you are a holy God. And you are righteous. And you are good. But we look to our hearts and our world, our government, our society, and we realize that we are fallen. We're corrupted by sin. And we cannot stand in your presence. We are guilty. And your word says we are awaiting the sentence of death. But Father, even despite the hopelessness that we have, there is hope. Not in us. Not in what we do. Not in getting our acts together and being churchy, as the children's story said. But our hope is in the shelter of Jesus Christ, our only hope in life and in death. And Father, we thank you that the hope of your word and the hope of the gospel is that you do not give us what we deserve, but you give us Christ that we don't deserve. And we must repent of our sin, of our waywardness, of living for ourselves, and believe and trust and turn to Christ by faith. And Father, we gather together because we need you. We recognize our brokenness, our sin, and we recognize the sweetness of Jesus. Father, we come to you today and we lift up, we lift up our congregation those who are away this morning, who are traveling as we speak, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, especially this morning for Colleen Phillips. As she awaits the surgery, uh, Thursday surgery, Lord, that you would hold her and protect her. We thank you for your common grace of doctors and nurses who know the body intricately, and we pray that you would guide and direct their hand. We pray for Gil as he loves his wife and helps her as she rehabs. But Lord, I pray, as Colleen feels her weakness, that her heart would be turned to Christ who is her strength. And Father, that she would find comfort in your word, strengthen her body, strengthen her heart, and strengthen her mind that she would be like Jesus. Father, we lift up to you this morning as well, Mike Burns, as he's grieving the loss of his, coven, his cousin. Lord, and we realize in times like this when our loved ones are swept away. 
how brief life is. It is but a vapor here today and gone tomorrow, but we trust and might trust that the word of the Lord stands forever. And I pray that as he grieves, you will comfort his heart with the hope of the gospel. Father, and I also lift up the Smith family, a dear family uh, of Denise and I, friends who attended Sovereign Grace for many years with us. Lord, as they grieve the loss of their 19-year-old son, Rush, who was taken in an instance. Father, and we grieve because this is not the way it's supposed to be. 19-year-olds are not supposed to be buried. And Father, we realize that we live in a broken world. We pray for Mike and we pray for Deborah. That in the midst of their grief, the hope of the gospel will encourage them. Knowing that though they bury Rush far too soon, they lay him in your hands, united by faith to Christ, and he will rise when you call his name, when you return to vanquish sin and to wipe away the tears and the pain and to make all things new as you have promised. We look forward to the day of the resurrection with hope through eyes filled with tears because there will be a day when all those tears are gone. In Christ's precious, victorious name we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Sometimes in our house, we will... um, You know what, Andrew? Would you get me some new batteries? Kind of go quick. Thank you. If you would bring up the the Proverbs quote. Uh, Sometimes in our house, we, um, when we have um, disagreements with our children about what they should be doing, um, we go back to the Proverbs. And I love the book of Proverbs because it teaches us the value of wisdom. And Proverbs 4, chapter 20 through 22 says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight, for keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. As Mike prayed today, uh, as we get older, we have this uh, accumulation of experiences and hopefully a little wisdom that goes along with that, and we give them and we dispense them to our children, and we call our children to heed our words from experience, from failings, from victories, that they would have success in life, and that they would um, take courage and do what is right. Thank you, son. And this morning we look at the Word of God and we realize that though mine and Denise's wisdom and y'all's wisdom is imperfect, the Word of God is His wisdom and it is perfect and it guides us in truth, Jesus says, for your Word is truth. This morning we are hearing from the Word of God which is the source of life and wisdom for all who are willing to listen. And not just hear the words and say, oh, what did daddy say, or what did mommy say, and the children can regurgitate it, but they're not listening, they're not connected at all, and ten minutes later, they, they, you ask your children, what, did you do what I asked you to do? And they said, we never, you never said anything about that, because we are not listening. Husbands, you're just as guilty as the kids, too. Uh, but we need to listen to the Word of God and do the Word of God. So this morning, my big idea and, and, uh, here is we either live by or we die without the Word of God or the Word of the Lord. And I'll leave this up here. I know the kids are, have these new sermon notebooks and they can write the big idea in there. We either live by or die without the Word of God. Okay, and I'm going to bring up the points, but I'll, go, I'll bring those back up. And and how do we do that? Your rebellion against the Word of God leads to judgments. 
and God's faithfulness leads to salvation. Our rebellion leads to judgment, and God's faithfulness leads to salvation. So again, we either live by or we die without the word of God. And I'm going to leave this up a little longer. Everybody works on this. But the first, our first point as we look through Zephaniah chapter 3 is this. Your rebellion or our rebellion leads to judgment. To put a little context here is as we are beginning the final chapter, we still are in the thick of the judgment of God. In earlier in chapter 2, we went through and God declares through Zephaniah that his judgment will come down on the Philistines, on the Ammonites and the Moabites. His judgment will come down on uh, the uh, Ethiopians and his judgment was going to come down on Nineveh. All the east, west, north, and south. And Judah at that point was probably feeling pretty good because these people deserve God's judgment. But now, as it hinges in chapter 3, the focus comes back to Judah, and the truth hits home, and the truth is about to hurt. Because they learn this, that their rebellion leads to judgment. Woe to her, verse 1, who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. Zephaniah is calling out Jerusalem, the city of David, the city where God had chosen his presence to dwell in the temple. And you see this threefold problem that he is addressing. Look at the first one. Rebellious. Jerusalem has rebelled against her God. And then what has she done? She has morally polluted herself. And then not only that, but she has oppressed others within the city. And this is a a problem. They have sinned against God. They have defiled themselves and they have oppressed others. And how have they done that? Four ways. One, the first way, in the the first line of verse 2, she listens to no voice. The fact that God spoke to his people was an incredible fact. I forgot to put it behind me, but here, listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 4 says, For ask now, Moses is speaking, of the days that are past, um, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from each end of the earth to the other whether such a great thing has ever happened or was ever heard of. And what is that great thing that Moses is referencing? Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire as he, you have heard and still live? And the answer is no. This is un- unbelievable that God has spoken to them. The voice of God speaking to these people is incredible. Of all the people on the earth, Of all the cities in the world, no people has ever heard the voice of God. Yet, what does it say Jerusalem did in verse 2? They refused to listen. She listens to no voice. And really, she is not listening to the voice. You know which one, Zephaniah says. The voice of God. They give, have given so little value to the voice of God that the law of God has been lost in the attic or the basement or the back storage room of the temple. They have cared so little for the voice of God that they have killed the prophets who have come along. They have adamantly refused to listen to the voice of God. Since that day, Jeremiah says, that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants and the prophets to them day after day, but they did not listen to me or incline their ear. They didn't even care that I was talking, God says. And they didn't even try to understand what I was saying. But what did they do? They stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Rather than heeding the voice of God, 
they accepted no correction. That second thing, not only did they listen, but they accepted no correction. In Jerusalem history, in Jerusalem's history, her covenant God sent calamities. Not calamities to destroy them, but to free them of the self-reliance and the rebellion and to say, come to me. You cannot trust those things. Come to me. Yet they adamantly refused to listen to God. They would not listen to the voice of God and they would not accept the correction that the voice of God did. They bowed up in willful defiance. They stiffened their neck. They adamantly refused to hear, heed God's discipline no matter what. Jerusalem tuned God out. And Jerusalem refused God's discipline. And the third thing, it says, they did not trust God. John Calvin says this, unbelief is the mother of all the evil deeds by which men willfully wrong and injure one another. If we don't trust God, we can do whatever we want to anybody. God is not sufficient to sustain me in this life. I must find someone else or something else to protect me. Sunday school, we talked about uh, Zacchaeus and stingy Christians. Why do our Christians st stingy? Because they don't trust that God will provide for them. God is not powerful enough to protect me or to guide me. I must go somewhere else. Like Eve in the garden, when uh, the serpent said, did God really say? At the heart of it, the serpent was attacking the character of God and sowing seeds of doubt into Eve's mind, and she didn't trust God. That his commandments were good, and that God wanted what's best for her, and God had designed her and knew what would cause her to thrive. So what did she do? She saw the fruit, and she took, and she ate, and Adam ate as well, because they did not trust the character of their God. Likewise, Jerusalem refused to trust their good and gracious God. It wasn't sufficient that Yahweh had sent them, brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't sufficient that he had given them a land flowing with milk and honey. It wasn't sufficient that he chose his um, place to dwell amongst them. Jerusalem, because they did not trust God, rejected God's sufficiency for their life. And then the fourth thing that we see at the end of verse 2, she does not draw near to God. When you don't trust a person, you hold them at arm's length. And you're very careful about what you say. You remain distant and you remain guarded. And because Jerusalem and Judah did not trust God, they didn't look at his promises with any veracity. They didn't trust his character. So they did not draw near to God in worship. They did not seek his presence. They did not desire his fellowship because he wasn't valuable to them. He wasn't worthy and they, like Moab and Ammon, became vain. And they became arrogant like Nineveh. They lived a complacent life, disconnected from God. They had zero motivation whatsoever to seek God. And they didn't care about private prayer. They didn't care about corporate worship. Why? Because God was not a, simply was not a priority. He was not valuable to them. So why give up a good day? Why give up my things? Why give up my money? Why give up my security? Why give up my time? God is not valuable. And they neglected God's fellowship. And the consequences, when we see in verse 2, the consequences of ignoring God and refusing His correction and rejecting Him and, um, and uh, neglecting God, they were profound. Look what the, they reaped because they did not value God. Verse 3 and 4, their individuals, their families, their government, and their society were oppressed. As Jeremiah says, or not Jeremiah, Zechariah 
no, yeah, Zechariah, where are we? Zephaniah. One of these prophets out here said this. Zephaniah says this. Her, verse 3 and 4. There were civil implications of their false worship and their relationship with God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves on the prowl, hungry, that leave nothing until the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The leaders of Jerusalem, both civil and religious, who were called to protect and serve the people, were devouring the flock of God. Does it sound like any country that you may know? Maybe you're a citizen of that country? By, maybe. That may be too, too up close and personal, right? Notice this. The officials, these officials who were called to serve the citizens under their care were like roaring lions who were exploiting their power in savage and destruction, destructive ways. Their judges who were supposed to uphold the law of God were like hungry wolves on the prowl and they were praying and tearing apart the weak, the vulnerable, and the powerless until there was nothing left of them. The prophets, okay, maybe the civil people don't have it together, but the prophets, they are the men of God. The prophets who were sent to declare this is what God says were reckless and worthless. They were proclaiming a message that did not further the kingdom or his glory, but lined their pockets and made their bellies fat. The priests who were supposed to maintain the, the temple of God and oversee worship and make sure it was right and true and just and beautiful. Instead, they be, had become so corrupt and so wicked that the priests themselves were profaning the temple and abusing God's people. If we cannot trust the people of God, and this is what's happening what hope does Jer Jerusalem have? You see, Jerusalem's rebellion against God, her, her refusal to heed and love and cherish the Word of God as a window to the heart of God had corrupted her city and her behavior. Her polluted personal religion defiled the public morality. And thus, Zephaniah declared in verse 1, Woe to her! who is rebellious against God, defiled in her worship, and oppressing the weak and vulnerable in their city. Spurning the word of God had bled them to the brink of destruction. And Zephaniah said in Zephaniah chapter 1, I will sweep away everything. They didn't listen to the prophets from Moses to Zephaniah. They did not learn from God's judgment on the nations. Verse 6, look what he did. He said, okay, if you won't listen to my prophets, look, look what I do to the nations. I will cut off the nations. I'll lay waste to the nations. I'll make their cities desolate like I do, I'm about to do to the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Ethiopians and the Ninevites. Watch it. And Israel yawned. did nothing. Their apathy and their complacence was alarming. Judah refused to change her ways, and instead, it only bolstered Jerusalem and Judah's rebellion against God. So God, in His grace, declared judgment in verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, He says. For the day when I rise up to seize the prey. And the reality is the people of God were the prey. And that's alarming. What? Wait, wait, wait. Not the nations? These people who call themselves followers of God? For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy, 
all the earth shall be consumed. The reality of the word of God says God will not sit idly by while people trample his holy witness, spurn his world, mar and mangle his good and beautiful creation from the people, our bodies, to our environment. God doesn't sit back idly. But notice, God doesn't come in like we do when our children leave their towels on the floor with reckless rage. What do we do? God is not, doesn't do it with reckless rage, with ugly pettiness, with unjust vindications. But God, in his complete control and patience, has declared that he will punish sin. He's not out of control. He's not in the zone that he has to come back and say, I am so sorry, I lost my mind. He sees the, uh, he gets angry about the right thing and in the right way. And as people, we usually get angry about the wrong things or we get the, angry about the right things in the wrong way. God is angry about the right things in the right way and he says, I will punish sin. And I've mentioned it before. It's just like when we see on TV when a 13-year-old is stabbed 114 times. We want the perpetrator to be punished. When a child is abused, we want that person to pay for what they have done to that child. That's justice. When we see racism clearly unfolding in for us, we say, that's wrong. And God says, I will deal with sin with truth and with justice. That is his promise. And a day will come when the nations of this world will be assembled before the Almighty God of the universe and He will have a complete knowledge of all things and He will deal with sin. This is not some capricious threat that says, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to just beat you. This is, you will stand before me and you will receive the sentence for your sin for you are guilty. And as a good judge deals with a guilty sinner. Not, and he says, I will pour out my indignation, my good and right justice, my burning anger about the right things in the right way, and in the fire of my jealousy. Not a petty jealousy, but like a husband is jealous for his wife in a good way. God is jealous for his people because he says, I love them too much to let them destroy themselves. Like you are jealous for the good of your children. You do not want them to destroy themselves. Second Peter talks about this day. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Everything will be seen. There will be no mistrials. There will be no hung jersey, there, juries. There will be no evidence that is withheld because it wasn't corrected properly. God's justice will be done and everything will be seen. In all of this, this promise that God has given is this. Judah still doesn't listen. They don't care. They don't heed the word of God and therefore they will die by the word of God. Brothers and sisters, as we see this, we either live by or die without the Word of God. We will. It's, it's, it's either one of these. Your rebellion leads to judgment. This is a promise. God, the judge, will punish sin. He will sentence wrongdoers. And He's revealed to us we are wrongdoers. We have a sentence that's coming. But in the middle of this, we don't go in despair. We don't go in hopelessness. We find hope. Even this little wrinkle of hope in verse 5. God's faithfulness leads to salvation. The hope of the gospel. The hope in the middle of Zephaniah. Honestly, you're, you're probably like, there's a lot of judgment you've been preaching lately. Wait till I get to the next sermon. 
it is fabulous. And it's like, okay, now we've, we hear the heaviness and you feel that, then all of a sudden you get this deep breath of fresh air and you see the goodness and the grace and the faithfulness of God and you're like, wow, that's what I deserved and this is what my heavenly Father has given me. This is fantastic. But verse 5, the Lord within her, Jerusalem, is righteous when Jerusalem is not righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each day he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. The hope of the gospel is in verse 5, in the midst of the dark cl clouds of judgments. Even in verse 2, when Judah would not listen, because verse 5 is amazing. Like there, I found it in one of the commentaries how it had two charts. And it had uh, verse 2, the four verses lined up, and then it had verse 5, the four lines uh, of the character of God. And on the left it said, Judah does not listen. And God was still speaking to his people. And then it said, Jerusalem would not accept discipline, but God was still making his just judgments known and judah would not trust god but god remained trustworthy and then it said judah refused to draw near to god but god it said god is always waiting for them to draw near like the prodigal father was waiting for his son in the distance and even in verse 3, you line up the princes and the, and the judges and the prophets, and then you line up the verse 5, the character of God. The princes were abdicating their responsibilities and serving themselves, but God never departed His throne where He rules faithfully over His creation. And the judges were satisfying themselves, but God was making His just judgments known. And prophets were treacherous, but God's declarations are pure and true. Priests were defiling the holiness, but God is setting and maintaining the standard of holiness. Though the people of God had rebelled, God was always present, and God was always good. And God was never failing. No matter how dark Judah sinned, and no matter how dark the sin is in the United States, no matter how dark the sin is in your life, and you feel it and you know it if you're honest with yourself, God is always present. And He's always good. And He's never failing. And He says to them, this city that he has declared his judgment, and it's coming. You can almost see the uh, invading marauders in the distance. But he goes back to chapter 2, verse 3. Seek me. Because remember, this is not chopped up. It's a one large letter. Chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord. Though the judgment is coming, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do His commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Seek the presence of God. Draw near to Him. Perhaps you will be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Ocean Park, we are faithless, but God is faithful. Will you heed the promise of His Word that there is a shelter on the day of the Lord? Will you seek His mercy? Because you need His mercy. We have not done what is right. We sing often, uh, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. That's the bad news of the gospel. His mercy is more. When the reality is, when you know better than anybody else what your sin is, and your failings, and your shame, the promise of the Word of God that He holds out and He dwells around you, He says, my mercy is more. And it's hard to believe. 
No, no, because I'm not like that. It's hard to believe the promise of the gospel. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Though Judah and Jerusalem, though Ocean Park and every single one of us, them time and time again are unfaithful, God remains faithful. His voice cries out to seek His grace and His mercy that is not found in anything we do, but it's found everything in the heart of God. He is your only hope in life and death. You can't work harder, bootstrap theology and pull yourself up and get it together. We don't have it together. We are standing before the judge and our sentence is set. But he says, seek me. And there is a shelter. He remains faithful. Turn to Christ in faith that you may be saved on the day of the judgment. There's a, this morning, Kevin read for us out of Matthew chapter 21 the parable of the tenants. And there was a master who planted a vineyard and he really put a lot of work into it. He, built the, he made the vineyards which take four or five years and he had a watchtower that would protect it and he built a wall to keep the critters out and he rented it out to tenant farmers on the agreement that at harvest time they would, the owner would receive a portion of that and he went into a distant country. And when the agreement time was, the, the, he sent his servants back and servant after servant was either beaten or killed or stoned. And it continued and continued until finally he said, I will send my son and surely they will listen to my son. But the tenant said, if we kill the heir, we get his inheritance, which was bad logic. But he says, we'll kill the son and it can be ours. And what did they do? They killed the son. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, what will, ha what will the owner do? And they said he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out to a vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of the seasons. When you read this parable, we see that God is the owner and the wicked tenants are the leaders of, of uh, Judaism, the servants of the prophets, and the Son is Jesus. To reject the shelter is to reject God. Fast forward 2,000 years, you have heard the Gospel. You have heard the Word of God that tells you your sins are many. We are guilty and we are waiting for the execution of our sentence, but the offer of mercy is held out to us. Will you listen to the servants, to the prophets and the apostles and the Son and turn from your wicked ways and that you may have mercy and grace to stand and on that day you will be sheltered by Christ? Or will you, like Judah and Jerusalem, ignore God's Word and faith, face God's burning wrath? Brothers and sisters, friends, we either live by or we die without the Word of God. So what do we do? Will you spurn the Word of God and die and face your judgment that you deserve? Or will you respond to the offer of the hope that is given to you in Christ? That He took my place and He gives me, not only did He get me off, He took the punishment in full and He gives us, me His righteousness that I may stand before God. And when God sees me, He sees the righteousness of Jesus that is not my own, but He welcomes me in because I belong to Jesus. First thing I encourage you this morning is to listen for the voice of God. I believe probably the greatest problem in the church today, in the big church everywhere, in our church, is a famine for the Word of God. The church digests an endless diet of junk foods and trans fats that are rotting our souls. We listen to Fox News and CNN and MSNBC more than we listen to the Word of God. If we all listen to the Word of God. We spend more time on Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and Peacock and all the other streaming services that thought we would save money, but now we're paying more than cable. Um, but uh, we spend more time 
ingesting the garbage and it's rotting our souls. We spend more time on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and all the other things the kids these days are using than the Word of God. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, tip, tip, or TikTok, Snapchat, whatever, MeWe, Parler, anybody who's even using that. The, more of that nonsense is coming into our souls than the Word of God. We have more memes, more gifts, more videos, more posts, and more blogs than we have for the Word of God. And if you don't believe me, pull up your screen time and go look how much time you spent on your phone this week. It will be, you won't want to show anybody. Andrew did a project for school, for FSCJ, and he had to ask his friends how much time they spent on their phones, and it was alarming. The average American spends five and a half hours on their phone daily. But according to the American Bible Society, only 9% of the average churchgoer reads their Bible each day, not including their church. And chances are, with the state of the evangelical church, you don't need your Bible and they don't talk about the Bible. There is a reason why we have a call to worship from the Word of God. There's an Old Testament reading where I spend time in the Word of God because I realize the reality is this may be the only nutrition you're getting. And it overwhelms me. We complain that we're in a spiritually, spiritual funk and God seems far away, but we shove our spiritual gullet with junk food that is destroying our hearts and killing our souls and polluting our minds. We quote often, self-righteously, when we're talking about those churches and over there, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And we go down and take pot shots at our favorite prosperity gospel people and the people that we think have compromised this. But the reality is this. The people in our pews, the people, man, in this pulpit, instead of listening to the Word of God, where do we form our worldview? From Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow. Those are our false prophets that are feeding us what we want to hear, and that is forming our opinions of this world rather than the kingdom of God. And that's why our souls are rotting. We, instead of desiring the kingdom of God, we want a liberal utopia or a conservative nostalgia of years gone past rather than submitting to the word of God. And the tragedy in our lives, in our church, is like the citizens of Jerusalem in the days of Zephaniah. We neither listen to the Word of God nor sub submit it when we happen to run across it. Ocean Park, we have defiled ourselves. We must repent. Put down your phones and pick up the Word of God. Put on your pants and come to worship on Sunday mornings. Thankfully, everybody has their pants on, so we're good. The live stream will destroy you. If you can physically come, you need to come. I think of people like Bertha Croson, who was 99 years old and seven-eighths. And she came every week and she sat through Sunday school and Sunday, and she couldn't hear a thing. All we could hear, she sat right where, about where Francesca is, all we could hear is feedback in her ears. And she, but she knew the Word of God was valued and treasured, and her presence for 99 years, God had been faithful to her, and she was following Jesus. Tony Kennard could barely walk, but he got in the back to be able to smile at people and come. Martha McGee couldn't see, but she could see Jesus, and it, was, it, it made our hearts burn to be like that. 
Your presence here this morning is encouraging me. I need it. We need each other. And rather than filling our hearts with the word of God and preaching to each other and encouraging one another and loving one another, we separate ourselves and we stay in bed. Turn off the TV and take time to pray and pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for the neighbor that that talking head on TV wants you to hate and love them and uphold the image of God in them. No matter what they believe and who they vote for, love them because they are image bearers of God. The most radical thing we can do is listen to the voice of God that says your neighbor, the liberal or the conservative, is made in the image of God and you're going to love them. Listen to the word and submit to God's correction. It's not enough to simply read your Bible. It's not enough to know its contents. It's not enough to to quote your favorite part. You must submit to it. Not just a few parts, all of it. Thomas Jefferson, we know him well for writing the Constitution in an incredible mind. But he's also known well for being an editor of the Bible. And for those of you who know the Jeffersonian Bible, he was the original copy and paster. He opened up the Word of God and said, hmm, I don't like that. And he literally cut out the verses he didn't like, left the things that he liked behind, and pasted them into a little Bible. Go look it up. Go Google it. He kept the parables and he kept the Sermon on the Mount but he cut out the miracles and he cut out the judgment and the things he found unseemly or Neanderthal-like. But sadly, Jefferson is not alone. All of us do that. And we must come under the authority of Scripture whether we like it or not. All Scripture, even the difficult ones, the odd ones, the verses that keep talking about judgment, what in the world? All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And the next verse says that the man or the woman of God will be equipped for every good deed. We need the Word of God. And a head knowledge that we memorize is not sufficient, but the humbling ourselves and coming under the Word of God. God has given us Scripture to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And to rebuke it, and to, um, uh, it's to rebuke us and correct us in instruction. And if we are not walking in the path that is illuminated by the Word of God, we are walking straight towards judgment according to the promises of God. Seek Christ and draw near. The best indicator to determine if you trust the Lord is by whether or not you obey Him. We don't follow who we don't trust, and you cannot trust who you do not know. That takes patience, that takes uh, uh, discipline, that takes perseverance. It takes prayer, it takes accountability, and it takes deliberate determination. You cannot do this alone. Brett McCracken, in the the Wisdom Period, our book, uh, Pyramid, I don't know why I keep saying that. He says this. Why are we here? In a world where we spend way too much time talking about ourselves on social media, blogs, and YouTube, and so forth, church allows us to talk about God and talk to God. It slows us down. And it reminds us that this thing that we're doing right now is not about us. This is about God. And he continues, he says, we sing of his attributes. We sing of his love and his mercy towards us. We declare it in our liturgy. Father, we have not done what we ought to do, and we don't do what we should. Heal us. We need your strength. We need your guidance. We need your forgiveness. We declare the truth in our liturgy, in our creeds, in our prayer. Why do we do this? And why do we repeat them? That it would saturate us and be the the old faithful way that will guide us. We are shaped by the story of the gospel in Bible readings, in preaching, in baptism, the Lord's Supper, confession, singing together, 
and reg- regular rituals that we do, the church reminds us this is not about us. And we work for six days and we rest and we come under and quiet our souls before the Almighty God. And six days we work, one day we rest. Six days we work, one day we rest. And on that Lord's Day, we devote ourselves to worship because He is worthy of worship and we need it. That's why we're here. The most countercultural thing that you can do on a Sunday morning is come to church. That's why there's no traffic. But at lunchtime, after lunch, when everybody comes out, there's traffic. Why? Because you're going to church. And I, I remember when the kids were little, it was, you know, put your pants on. That's not where, how, and they're fighting, and Denise and I are bickering, and, you know, it's a lovely car drive to church. So everything's great. And it's difficult. And sometimes you think, is it even worth it? But I, when I see faces of young families, it encourages me. And when I see the, um, the white hair of maturity and wisdom, who for 60 plus years have been walking in the Lord, it encourages me and encourages me as a 43-year-old man, keep going, keep walking, keep being faithful. And when I hear them sing, from the little ones to the, the, the mature ones, it encourages my soul and it reminds me why we're here. We need to be encouraged and be encouraged by one another. We need to be correct. Uh, we need to correct and be corrected. We need to be loved and be loved. We need to serve and be served. We need to put our arms around each other when we're discouraged, and we need a swift kick in the pants when we're too full of ourselves. And the more you see Christ and you draw near, you will begin to trust God more and know God more and learn God more. And it's not just from the liturgy and the preaching, but it's when somebody comes up beside you and says, listen, Mary, I'm so glad you're here. I've been praying for you this week. Or you have encouraged me so much by being here. Brothers and sisters, that we can come together with songs that have been forgotten. And we can sing words like, Great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not, thy compassion they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Brothers and sisters, listen for the voice of God. Submit your life to his word. Seek Christ and draw near Because we will either live by his word or we will die by his word. May we have life. Jesus, we pray. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. To hear your word and be formed by your faithfulness. By the old ways and the old paths that are tried and true and marked out by our creator. May we listen and submit and draw near that we we may have life. In Christ's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.